Welcome one, welcome all to the new Legacy Cast, uh, formerly known as Tales of Tyria. i got a couple of uh, little news tidbits for you guys. Bridger has been uh, hired by ArenaNet to do the official Guild Wars 2 podcast, so he will, uh, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, not be with us anymore. Uh, that being said, we uh, have a whole brand new cast of members, uh, all, of course, all Team Legacy members, because we're going to be you know, shooting this straight to a PvP podcast, none of that casual BS that Bridger did. And uh, that being said, let me go ahead and introduce them uh, around the table here. We have Jay Vega. How's it going, Jay Vega? Pretty good. How are you? Pretty excited about uh, all the changes we got going on over here. Yeah, so what do you think about Bridger leaving? Um, I mean, you know... I. Good for him for you know getting hired by ArenaNet. Um, oh come on, we don't care. I, I don't <laughs> care. Good riddance. Yeah, it's Good Bridger. Riddance. I mean, uh, and uh, I was I was trying to be nice about it, but yeah, yeah uh, he's riddance. not here. It doesn't matter anymore. So uh, we have our next great, great uh, in new introduction to Team Legacy, by the way, because this is a Legacy cast production and has to be all Team Legacy members. So we decided to recruit Kai. So how's it going, Kai? I'm great. I'm looking forward to getting my Legacy t-shirt. I'm really excited and um, finally like saying bye to Deuces because, you know, Legacy for the win. Whee! So how are you going to deal with that uh, 300, 400 ping playing on the U.S. servers? Oh, I'll be fine. I'm sure like you'll teach me how to be pro and stuff anyway, so <laughs> it'll be fine. <laughs> All right. We have our uh, third uh, Team Legacy member, the all-awesome Okuraku. How's it going, man? Hello. Glad to be a so, part of this new show. Absolutely. So uh, Legacy Cast, as you guys know, is going to be uh, focused 100% around PvP. We're going to hit on a few new things. Uh, we're going to be talking about the new Elite skill, the Water Bucket, which I got to tell you, there's a lot of debate with that one because uh, I watched a Mesmer use it. And Mesmer clone water bucket, I'm not too sure about that. So um, we'll definitely be getting into that. Another thing, Guru shutting down um, due to the official forums coming out. That's uh, that's also a big one. So we'll get to those topics. We'll talk about the mailbag here uh, a little bit after that, and uh, we'll kick it off. So uh, Vega, water bucket, man, Mesmer, water bucket. What do you think? Uh, I, I, it's, I think it's going to be overpowered. I mean, the water bucket, in, in terms of shutting down the elementalist, I'm assuming you could pour the water bucket on the ele elementalist if they're doing some sort of fire elemental thing or whatever, but... Uh, I don't know, you know, putting out an elementalist, it sounds appetizing, but I could definitely see a lot of elementalists QQing about it. It could be like a new kind of like dispel, like if an ele a fire elementalist looks put like burn on someone, then you could get the water bucket and kind of use it to put them out so that, you know, they don't get burned continually. Like, I think that's quite good. That, that, okay. that could be very useful in the world versus world. You just have one guy running around with a water bucket, just putting people out. Absolutely. So um, we're going to go ahead and hit the music. When we get back, folks, we're going to be talking about WoW and the latest uh, expansion and Pandas. Uh, we'll spend about 30 minutes on that, and then we'll, we might get back to Guild Wars 2 after that. See you guys in a bit. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, crawling back from the grave, it is Bridger. This week is going to be fantastic April Fool's episode. Stay tuned. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, welcome one, welcome all to the <laughs> official <laughs> Tales of Cheerios <laughs> Guild Wars 2 show. A uh, bit, bit of a fun time we had there planning that, and uh, I'm sure it didn't fool anybody except maybe some of the audio listeners that are listening to this like four days from now, completely forgetting that this was the April 1st show. Uh, but welcome to the actual show. I've got some real show notes here for you people in the chat room post those for you right now if you want to check those out. Actually, today we are going to do a bunch of interesting things. We've got a great bit of uh, links here. We've got the ArenaNet president talking about micro 
transactions. Uh, we've got some very interesting articles uh, separating the wheat from chaff, from tap repeatedly. A PC Gamer interview talks about TF2 being a big influence for Guild Wars 2 class system. And then we've got a whole bunch of stuff from the mailbag this week. So... Hope you guys in the chat room are going to love this. We uh, are going to basically skip the introduction because we just did that. But how is everybody doing today? Very good. Yes, Glad yes. to be back. <laughs> I'm like shaking now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you like that acting career. Oh, yes. <laughs> I, I just love that guy in chat that's like, are they seriously going to talk about WoW for 30 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> When you, I could hold I back, to, but I read that. I had to mute my mic and like cover my mouth when you said, "All right, we'll be right back and talking about pandas for thirty minutes." <laughs> <laughs> I had to mute my mic. Oh, and then I missed the transition. Was... I had the wrong because I had that stuff from the stupid fake Guild Wars Two Elite skill up in the background making the noise. <laughs> so I had this guy. <laughs> <laughs> in the it was background. when Vega was like, they can run around and just like put loads of people out with water. <laughs> I was just like, oh man, I'm going to laugh so much. And uh, yeah, that was very interesting. I'd have to say that's one of the best ones that I've seen so far. But I'm very disappointed we didn't see any like equivalent to how awesome the Commando was last year. From a yeah, yeah. It's kind of hard to top that. Unless maybe <laughs> the, the Minstrel was Mesmer's, uh, the, the Mesmer reveal of the Minstrel was, uh, maybe that was ArenaNet like, like three months early on their April Fool's joke. <laughs> preemptive, preemptive strike. It's possible. See, I played a minstrel in Lord of the Rings Online. I am not amused right now because <laughs> I respected that class. I could own others 1v1 in that class. And here they are teasing me with a minstrel. I got to tell you. Okay, fair enough, fair <laughs> enough. All right, so... Let's get into some actual news here. And this is actually, uh, PC Gamer's been putting up a lot of good stuff here about uh, Guild Wars 2 recently. This is uh, apparently an, uh, this is a, an interview. Uh, he says, uh, this is Chris Thurston from PC Gamer. Quote, I had a chance to sit down with ArenaNet president Mike O'Brien for a chat about the industry. And there were a bunch of very interesting things that Mike O'Brien said in here. Uh, sorry, unquote. Uh, there were a bunch of interesting things Mike O'Brien said in here. One of them, I thought, was the following. Quote, the reaction we expect from the world is skepticism. It should be that way because there are a lot of games out there that are doing dicey things with microtransactions. We hold ourselves to high standards and we've tested things. We've put this stuff in front of our core beta group and said, you guys should be holding us to those high standards, unquote. So that's sort of a nice uh, sort of to back up what a lot of us have been saying with the calm down. They're not going to do anything underhanded here. This is Arena Net we're talking about. They had a cash shop in Guild Wars One. It's not going to be that big of a deal. Freelancer, we didn't get your uh, opinion on the on the cash shop last week because we missed you. What's your what's your thoughts on this whole thing? A couple of weeks out now that we've uh, learned more about it. Well, in terms of the gems and such, I mean, we all saw that coming, right? I mean, that's pretty fair to say. We knew there was going to be something like that. League of Legends and all of these big games now are doing it. Mm -hmm. um, I, in terms of balance, you know, I listened to. Uh, last week's and i love the episode by the way and the way you guys were breaking it down but you get a lot of the discussion was on the balance of it'll be you know throw the economy all out of whack i don't think it will um it, you're gonna it's gonna come down to players that want to buy the permanent things um for example like the extra bag slot uh, extra bag space or the extra character slot once players get that and that's given a set price, then everything else is trivial. I don't think you're going to see a ton of people trading gems and stuff nonstop. I mean, it's going to come down to how many gems do I need for that character slot, the bag slot, and what was that third thing, Bridger? It was a bank um, slot, a uh, character slot, and a bag. Uh, okay, uh, bank slot. So you you look at these three things, you bundle them up, you make the decision, okay, how many gems does it cost to get the three things, Okay. Once that value is associated, that's going to be the standard trading value for all gems from then, then forth. Because 90% of players out there are only going to want those three things. I'm telling you right now, they're not going to care about the little trivial uh, uh, boost to, to whatever might be health, attack damage, what have you, experience, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They're not going to care about that. What they're going to care is how many gems do I need to get in order to get those three permanent things. Once they get that, once they have a set value for that and everybody's trading for that value, that's that's the end of that economy. And then you'll get uh, certain amounts of people later on that are creating new accounts or get their friends on that also want that. But that's going to be it. All this other stuff they added, I don't think you're going to see it at all. I mean, the Siege Golem and... Um, what about the crates? I mean, TF2 
has a lot of people buying those stupid keys. Uh, it's going to depend on what's in those crates. I mean, we both know uh, if there's an item in that crate that is equivalent to, let's say, something that is worth 600 gems, then you have to make the conscious decision of whether the open that crate costs six or is worth that money or not. Um, if you look at Eve Online, okay? Uh, I don't know if you guys, I don't remember if you guys brought this up or not, but Eve Online does this perfectly. Now, what is the one permanent thing everybody wants in Eve Online? Vega subscription, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so you got your subscription that everybody is aiming to get in EVE Online because you can pay for it both with in-game currency and real money. So you have a static, a, you have a very set uh, item that doesn't change in value, that is always the same price and therefore uh, determines the rest of the economy. The same thing's going to happen with these character slots. And once that value is associated, everything else in the cash shop, everything else in the, in the market will be associated to those three uh, permanent items well the other things that i think that are going to be not permanent but there's going to be a low level of activity on them all the time is probably character name changes character server transfers and maybe character makeovers so you can go back and like recreate your character's looks those kinds of account based things and things like the character slots the bank slots those kinds of things i agree with you are going to be the bigger drivers of gems because they're not in-game items that are things that you could buy with gold those are things and, and we know you can buy everything with gold, but things that you could acquire it through other ways. So. Well, with character transfers, all right. So, what kind of people actually transfer their characters, Bridger? Uh, let's. What do you, what, what kind of players do you think actually do that consistently or at all? I don't think there's going to be a lot of people, but if you've got millions of people playing the game, even you know, 0.1 percent is going to be a, a month is going to be a, a a decent amount. Exactly. You know I mean? So, 0.1 percent. Now, how many people do you think in this chat, in this game, in the beta, wants extra bag space? Lots of people. Like, exactly. Well, <laughs> we'll, we'll say we'll say a whole lot more. How about that? Um, and so that being said, you know, you're going to get into the game six months down the road. You may not need it immediately, but you're going to see that guy that has all that extra backspace. You're going to see the extra character slot or what have you, and you're going to want that, and you're going to know it's a one-time purchase. And you're, if you're going to buy anything, it's going to be those first. Guarantee it. You, the people buying character transfers, which there's a lot of debate about in the community, are going to be people that are switching over from the losing server to the winning server. Yeah, and I think that, that might be the case. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's what it's all about. Everybody knows it. Nobody wants to say it, but that's exactly what's going to happen. The people buying these character transfers, 90% of them, are going to be the ones that are QQing on their losing servers that don't want to take their community, try to work to be better, and actually go through that process that guilds like Team Legacy and Kai's Guild right now, Deuces, are doing. They don't want to do that work. What they want is a free ride. So they're going to buy these character transfers, transfer to the winning servers, and expect free handouts and i hate to say it but that's what they're shaping up to be with those particular types of items and i'm done yeah. with my rant <laughs> <laughs> I, see the, the the one thing i do like about the whole system is that for the the 10 percent that aren't uh transferring servers for those petty means uh for example like you know transferring servers for some other reason the fact that you don't have to pay money to do so. That if you just want to play a lot and get the gold and then, you know, trade up to gems and then do that transfer, that you can. That it's just another option that you don't have to throw down real money. As in other MMOs where if you want to go to another server, you have to throw down real money and that's the only way to do it. Or if you want to do a character change or a name change, you have to throw down real money. It might take a hell of a lot longer to build up that gold to get the gems. But just the fact that you can do that I think is I think it's good for the yeah. for overall the other thing that um, in that article the one thing that I feel a lot of people might could could kind of be indifferent about was that um, he was kind of saying that let's say there's X item that you want that there's two ways you could get about you could go about getting it either you can pay some money to get the gold and then buy that item or you could play the game a lot spend time and get the same amount of gold to buy that item. And he was kind of saying how it's for the people that either one can play a lot and have that time to dedicate or the people who don't have a lot of time and want to spend money. And I feel that there's going to be people that for the devil's advocate sake of arguing that are, well, I don't want to play a lot and I don't want to spend money. So why can't I get that item? Mm -hmm. And I think freelancer is completely 
underappreciating how many our peers are going to want to get married and therefore have to buy the wedding dress oh, and the come tuxedo. On. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to drive prices up. I'm just kidding. I don't want to hear that BS. You know what? You know what? This is good. We're going to call. We're going to call these nomads. We're going to call these players that want free rides they 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 see the numbers bridger right they okay. just see the achievement points and they're like i gotta have those pvp world v world achievement points because that's the only thing i'm missing you know so they completely rip off their server for whatever amount of gold they can get exchange it to gems transfer to the winning servers and <laughs> they will do that they will do that in Eve mass style. Eve style. and and Sneaky. good players, good, decent players that are actually working with not only their own guild, but trying to help other guilds as well, so that it's a giant server community, because that's what this is all about, are going to have to deal with these guys that are popping and say, hey guys, what's up, my name's Bob, and I was a <laughs> kick-ass player on the last server I was on, so you should take me in. Well, you know, and what would fix that is, uh, is just, just uh, do a two-month cooldown on server Mm -hmm. That Isn't would that be just, a proper Rift, fix. Rift introduced it where, I know it's not as big as that, but they said you could change server, but there was a week cooldown. I think even though it's only a week, it still stops people hopping because, you know, they would switch. And a week is a long time in kind of MMO gaming terms in the sense if you're stuck somewhere for a week and you don't want to play, it kind of sucks. It feels like a really long time. So any kind of cooldown on transferring, whether it be a week or a month, I still think will be some form of penalty so people won't just keep hopping and changing but I mean I like the way the cash up works in the sense as you compare it to league in the way that you have the opportunity to build up like IP points to buy champions or you can buy riot points and get the champions that way like all kinds of people can buy new champions and things like that which means you know everyone has the same opportunities and I kind of agree with that I like that all right, so let us uh, move on to the next one here. Uh, tap repeatedly. This, there's not a whole lot to, you know, this is a very big article, so I don't want to go over everything. But and, and by the way, the links to all of these are in the show notes. So if you want to check those out, you can either check them in the description if you're watching on YouTube or go to talesoftyria.com and check the show notes for this particular episode, number 25. Now, Tap repeatedly had a, a, a post they said separating the wheat from the chaff. And they basically addressed a lot of the QQing and, and and complaints and, and, and worries that a lot of people had because there were eh, like 10 people that came out of the closed beta test on Friday and said, this game's shit, nobody likes it, and it's garbage, and here's why I face roll the computer and kill everything. Uh, basically, they, they played till level 5 and said, this game's too easy. And so he basically talked a lot about the different things. The things that he covers here is uh, guardians are so overpowered, engineers are too complex, combat is whack-a-mole, dodge is pointless, it's nothing like Guild Wars 1. So he goes over all this stuff, and I think he does a really good job of, of addressing each of these and talking about them in a realistic way. Um, so I would highly recommend it. Did you guys take anything away from the, this in, in uh, particular that you thought was interesting, or we can mo move on either way? We can move on. It's tap repeatedly. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, no, I'm, I'm not going to bash them. I, I've watched a lot of their editors. They seem like they just like to talk. You know, they're kind of like you, Bridger. They, we just love talking. And uh, for them, it, they, I don't know. I'm going to stop there before I get in trouble. <laughs> okay, then. We've also got uh, PC Gamer again hitting the Chris, – Chris Thurston hitting the same uh, notes talking about how Team Fortress inter influenced Guild Wars 2 class system. And they basically talked to John Peters. Peters said, I'm the anti-healer person. I don't hate that people who play the – the support roles it's just that i want that role to be fun i don't think there's any teamwork what there is is just dependency unquote so let's let's talk about that for a second because that kind of blew my mind and i'm trying to really wrap my head around it what he's claiming is that in other mmo style games the healer role is not really a role that interacts with the other classes in the same way that teamwork is required in, say, an FPS game like TF2. What he says is the other classes are dependent upon the healer. All the classes are dependent upon the tank, but, there's, but there's, that's not the same as teamwork. Uh, Kai, what are your thoughts? Is dependency teamwork? Are those the same things, or are they discreetly different things? 
I, yeah, I think dependency is not teamwork at all. I mean, when you raid, say you have two tanks and five healers, everyone is relying on the tank not to die and the healer to heal the tank or the raid. And I think the DPS just think they can flail around doing whatever they like and because there's someone that's going to heal them. And it's not teamwork. They stand in fire and stand in green stuff and they know someone is going to heal them. And it's just relying on someone. It's not working as a team. It's just knowing that someone else is going to save your ass when you get and God forbid you don't heal them because then you're going to get a <laughs> slew of anger yeah, towards you. Crap. Oh my God, right. worst healer ever. Yeah. Exactly. So everyone just blames it on the two people that they rely on. Even though they rely on them, they blame them for everything that goes wrong. I think Guild Wars 2 has a much better way of doing things so everyone works together to help everyone survive and res people back up and stuff like that. All right, Vega, your thoughts. Dependency versus teamwork. Go. Um... Well, I think that there is a sort of link between dependency and teamwork. Not necessarily saying that that's good, but I, I like how the fact that um, the way I always look at the Trinity is that it's like a three-legged stool, that if you take away any one of those legs, the Trinity falls apart. So if you have a bad healer, it falls apart. If you have a bad tank, it falls apart. And if you have a bad DPS, it falls apart. But I feel that... If you have that... a bad DPS, he's probably not at his computer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the thing is, is that no one ever blames the DPS. It's always the tank's fault or the healer's fault. And, ah. the, and when everyone's the DPS and everyone is kind of doing everything, so you can't blame one person. And that makes teamwork. There's no I in team. I, I like how Edwin But just there's a it. me. It's codependent Shh, versus... Damn it, Bridger. Damn it. I mean, freelancer, sorry. <laughs> what did I do? What did I do? <laughs> go back to your Guild Wars 2 official podcast. <laughs> yeah, go back I, to Arena now. I like what Edwin um, said here. Codependent versus interdependent. Yeah, like... You, I you don't even know what that means, but it sounds like that's what I'm trying to think about. <laughs> well, I think, like, codependent is that... Um, like, interdependent is if you don't need anyone... And codependent is when you need at least another person to kind of do something with. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think that makes it's sense. It's codependent. We rely on each other to survive. And if you're, yeah, like independent, you don't need anyone. Well, he's said interdependent. Dependent Inter on others in, in, I don't even know. I don't well, even, I, I'm I, just blowing my mind going, going back, Going back to the article, I do like how they've, they've said how they, they appreciate TF2. Because in my mind... Um, TF2 did amazing things for the FPS genre in terms of creating teamwork because as soon as you get into TF2, you immediately, uh, maybe not immediately, but it's very natural to kind of fall into the team and figure out what the team needs. And if Guild Wars 2 achieves that in terms of what TF2 did for, for FPSs, everything kind of flows nicely and then you, you don't need to worry about finding a good healer and a good tank you just naturally kind of figure out what you need to be a good team. So, Freelancer, your thoughts. Okay, well, let's put it like this to make to kind of simplify it. If we are playing League of Legends, Bridger, and I'm sitting in bot lane as an AD carry, okay, I'm doing the damage for all you League of Legends or non-League of Legends player out there, mm -hmm. and Bridger, you're the healer. You're uh, Tarek, okay? okay? So you, you spam heals. Now, dependency... Uh, or let me ask you this: What do you think it is? What do you think it is called when I get near death and you heal me? Is that being a team player or is that being dependent? Right there. What do you think? Both. Both. Why so? Because if you didn't heal him, you wouldn't be a team player. But at the same time, <laughs> he needs your heals to not die. So he's no, dependent. On, he's dependent I, I, on your heals. I don't think I don't think I think it's 100% dependency because guess what happens if I die and you're sitting there? You're gonna blame me. <laughs> <laughs> Why you no I, heal me? Listen, listen. If I went in there, it would have just gotten me killed. That's all I'm saying. Okay, wait a minute. <laughs> what? I, I think the difference is 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 whether it's dependency is where whether you think it's just coming naturally like. I see that class, I know that class can give me this benefit. In TF2, you, you, we brought it up originally, the medic, for a, if the medic's running around with the soldier, healing the soldier, that's not teamwork, that's dependency, because the soldier knows by getting that overheal that he can do a few rocket jumps before he is actually you know, in the, in the red. So 
that that right there is dependency. Now, teamwork right at that moment would be the soldier letting the the medic know that he is rocket jumping as he's doing it, and where he's heading afterwards, and then coming back to the medic. Mm -hmm. And the, I just think the, the the only difference we're discussing here is whether it, it involves forethought and planning, and whether it doesn't. Because um, in Guild Wars 2, dependency is, is almost null and void. We know how that works. I mean, you're going to be dependent on no one, but at the same time be uh, dependent on everyone. And um, the teamwork just comes naturally because when you don't have to worry about being the anti-CC -er or being the healer or being the tank, you have more time to think about, I wonder if I could do a cross-class combo with that guy, you know, or... I wonder if uh, if he does this, I can follow up with this, and so you start thinking about it far beyond than just the he's t he's taking my damage, you know. So he's a good tank, and it goes more in depth than that. Yeah, I mean, my my thought was if if your role feels like a single player game, then it's probably not teamwork. Like if the tank could, you know, you could you could create a tank simulator, and that sounds. Like a completely different game, but uh, if you can make a tank simulator where you have a boss and you have a bunch of you know pretend teammates that all are trying to aggro the boss and you're trying to hold aggro, it just seems to me like that you could you could that that could feel a lot like a single player game. Like the game is don't let this guy hit those you know civilians behind you. And the same thing when it comes to oh does he disapprove? Overseer Cat disapproves of my analogy. Uh, I will move on then. I have been booed off the stage. <laughs> I guess, but the same kind of thing is is is, and that's kind of what ArenaNet was emphasizing in the other article was that healing in those other games kind of feels like a really boring job. You're just staring at bars and you're clicking them when they get low. That feels like somebody's just depending upon you to do to push your button over and over again at the right time in order to help the team win. That doesn't feel like teamwork to me. Uh, so that's that's my input on it. And uh, I guess with that, we'll move on to some more very interesting things we got going on here. Because uh, I've been actually browsing MMO Champion. I don't know. Have you guys been to MMO Champion before? I love MMO not, Champion. Not recently. They've actually got a, a lot of very interesting discussion going on in their Guild Wars section. Guild Wars you, 2 section. You know, I've got to say with MMO Champion, I think you'll agree, Bridger, um, of all the forums out there that have Guild Wars 2 sections, mm -hmm. they probably have some of the best conversation going on, yes. I would say. I, uh, I go there pretty often during my lunch breaks. So I'm on my phone and I browse their forums pretty often. It just It's well moderated and it's just I guess the intelligence bar is a little higher than most forums. So. Yeah, they seem, to, they seem to have some very, uh, very active and competent people. Uh, grammatically and like argumentatively, like there's not people going in there making straw man arguments all over the place and throwing in logical fallacies on all the things and throwing everything off topic based on some other, you know, it's just, it's very, uh, it's usually on topic stuff that has, a, that has some very interesting discussions and they bring up some stuff that I hadn't seen before. But one of the things that has been going on there recently is a thread about add ons. And there's a lot of, MM, of World of Warcraft players on there that have a lot of add-ons on their uh, on their World of Warcraft account, and they're very they're very attached to those add-ons. And that thread has been going for a very long time. And I'm reading the thread, and I'm responding to the thread, and it's making me a little upset. And when I get upset, I got to vent. And when I vent, it's called a Bridger rant. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, we're getting into it right here. So I'm going to MMO Champion, and I'm typing in WoW add-ons. Is the, is the thread I'm looking in right there. And I'm looking at all the different things that I can get, and there is just tons and tons of stuff. People are saying, well, we've got recount. We need recount. We need to know DPS damage bars. I need to know what hell my team is doing. If I don't know who to blame for when the raid goes wrong, what's going to go? What's going to happen? How am I going to do that? I got I to gotta see. So then I'm just thinking to myself, why do we need add-ons? Ladies and gentlemen, add-ons are there to provide functionality that's missing. Why is that functionality missing in the first place? Why do we need add-ons to do it? I mean, you, you look at some of the screens that people had in World of Warcraft, and it's unbelievable. You don't see anything left on the screen. It's just, it's just a tiny little piece, and I'm looking for it right now, and I can't find a good example, but there we go. So let's, let's pull this, this thing open full screen if I can, because you're not looking at the game. You're not looking at the game at all. You're looking at uh, a tiny tiny, tiny sliver 
of what would be the game. Instead, you've got you've got bars over here, and you've got tons and tons and tons of skills all over the place, and you've got counters, and you've got these things telling you when the boss timer's gonna work, and you're not playing a game anymore. You're watching a giant interface, and that's something that ArenaNet's trying to avoid, right? Nobody wants that. So the question is, if you're hugely in favor of add-ons, why is this loading so slowly? I just don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm on dial up here. I don't know. <laughs> it's ruining my whole flow. So I just have to ask, if you're really in favor of add-ons, why don't you just want ArenaNet to put that functionality in there? Because then I have to ask, if you just want to be the only one with this cool add-on that gives you an advantage, doesn't that just make you an elitist prick? <laughs> I would rather everybody have access to these to the to the add-ons if they improve the game, and if they don't improve the game, get rid of them. Yeah, that's too much. Look at all of that on the screen. Yeah, this was supposed to be up like ten minutes ago during the middle of the rant. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's ridiculous. That is so much. That's not too too different from what I had set up. Uh, I feel like, I feel the like bad part be... is guilty as charged. I can tell you almost nine out of, almost ninety percent of those add-ons there and what they do yeah. and why they're important to this player. I understand mm -hmm. why they're important. I'm gonna go hide from Bridger under a rock now. So. No, I used add-ons in World of Warcraft too. I used them all the time. I had. You Oshner, needed them for a while though. You, you couldn't. You couldn't, you couldn't play without them. That's that's no. why the game was broken. Well, at the start, definitely, there were so many add-ons you needed all the time, and Bl Blizzard wound up adding a lot of those in to yeah. the general UI, but there were still things that made, for example, healing so much ridiculous. They, like, simplified healing down to nothing, right? I mean, they... Like click. They, yeah, <laughs> click. <it> click. <laughs> you either click, you right-click to do a small heal, you left-click yeah. to do a big heal, and then you use your mouse click to do, like, a cleanse of some poison, because if it turns purple, that means they're poisoned, and you can the heal The particular them. mod you're talking about is called Heal Bot, and it, yes. it literally was simplified to the point that you could just mouse over what you needed to heal and press the thing, yeah. uh, press your particular key, and you didn't have to do anything after that. It would cast whatever heals it needed, mm -hmm. depending yeah. on how much health was in that little square. Oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah, it, it, and I got to tell you, you know, uh, my roommate, uh, he played a druid for psh, the better part of five years. And uh, he, even now, he's a hardcore raider. bad he he's not he, he could be on skype talking and he just corner of his eye looking to see what squares <laughs> are getting down in the red and he just mouses over them and that's it that's and that's the entire yeah. fight that's you know? so like i i that's the one thing i hate about wow is that and it's not it's not even the fact that all right yeah heal bot's nice and makes things easier it's the fact that you can't go into a raid and it, like if I go into a raid as a druid without heal bot, and oh, people I, ask I kick me, you out of my raid. Exactly. <laughs> you you can't you can't do these things without those add-ons, and that's ridiculous. The only add-ons that I would like, okay, I wouldn't like them. The only add-ons that I wouldn't features. Hate Let's say features are the ones are the ones that I could like move the map around or change the size of the UI. Yeah. Things like that. Things that aren't just, you know mouse over a bar and click and all of a sudden you're healing someone for the exact skill that you need to heal them for without even thinking about it you know you're you're completely taking everything out of the game at that point and at that point it's just the whole game's broken in my well, opinion that kind of healing is kind of irrelevant in guild wars 2 now but what do you think about the lack of a damage meter or a way to track your damage I want to know, as a Mesmer, we talked about this, I think, in like the first episode of Tales of Tyria. Mm -hmm. I want to know, as a Mesmer, if this skill rotation I'm using is doing more damage per second than if I switched out and did this. Right now in Guild Wars 2, there's no way to know that. And it also kind of goes into that whole thing we talked about also, where um, you, you get done a, a, a public event, and they give you a gold medal. Or let's say you got a silver medal, because we all know, you know, Bridger's going to get silver medals. Well, oh, no. <laughs> so, you. so I Bridger... Have, I have my finger on the disconnect button, sir. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so, so Bridger gets this silver medal, right? And he's always getting these silver medals, and he wants to know, gosh darn it, why is Freelancer always getting gold and I'm always getting silver? What do I need to do in order to do better in this? What Do I need to do more damage? How much damage am I doing? And you have no way of knowing right now, and that still bothers me. So if they allow so much of a, a, an add-on just to do that basic thing, I See, will be one happy camper. 
See, I wouldn't want an add-on for it. For for knowing what your DPS is, I would be happy with. They have the sort of like sparring dummies that you could go up to and attack. They've and said that they'll have damage. that. They had that what in I, Wars One, right? Yeah. What what I think would be nice is not having an add-on that shows your DPS at all times. Having those dummies that when you're attacking them, there's a little icon or a little pop-up over that dummy that says this is your current DPS. It shows what your damage is doing, you know, each, each attack, each skill, whatever, but then on the side it shows here's your DPS. This way that you know what your build is, you know what your skills are, and you know what your maximum DPS could possibly be in a perfectly ideal situation. That, yeah. is to, that to me is, a, is like a nice middle ground between no add-ons and add-ons. That's just me. I, I know, yeah, I, I, know free, I know, I could see, I could see freelancers working, and I know he hates it. <laughs> I know he hates it. I like the I, idea that you can do it on dummies, but personally, ignore the whole like DPS meter thing. A combat log, I would like not for how much damage I'm doing, but if I die, I want to know what move killed me, how much damage did it do, um, who used what, so I can avoid it in the future. In like, for example, in WoW, a combat log, you can say this hit you for so much damage, this much overkill, and it'd just be nice to know what killed me, so that I can know for future reference and things like that. Because at first you're like, oh god, crap, I've died. Like, oh my god, what killed me? And you just stood there like, uh. So it'd a be League cool of Legends fun. style recap. I mean, League of Legends wasn't the only one that does yeah, it. Just the one that popped cool. into my head that shows you, you know, these are the six abilities that hit you in the last, you know, ten seconds of your life. They did this much damage of this type yeah. and yeah that definitely would help the learning process for a lot of people and i think they've put the rudimentary beginnings of that if you watch some of the videos from the most recent press beta they have that when you die there's a screen that shows you all the abilities in the last i don't know so many seconds it's not nearly as pretty as the league of legends version it still seems to be sort of an early implementation of it but it does give huh. you mostly all the relevant information you'd like as regards to that See, it's going to go like this. We're going to be out in World v. World, me and Vega, right? We're going to be leading our Team Legacy raid. Next thing you know, Deuce just comes around the corner, and they, you know, they're glaring. They got that serious face on. You know, the whole, we're serious is all heck about not dying, right? So they, uh, they're coming up against Team Legacy, and all of a sudden, Kai just gets nuked out of nowhere. And she's like, oh, my God, WTF, what was that? And she can look at the combat log and then say, <laughs> Freelancer, you know, out loud. <laughs> <laughs> and then me and Vega could do like a virtual high five, you know, and then yeah. run away like a. Like you can look up at the camera <laughs> shaking way, your which fist. Which way is the high five? Am I going the right way? <laughs> oh, yeah, way? that's that way. It's that way. Is it this way? <laughs> now you're oh, patting her on the way. shoulder. I... <laughs> oh, dear. Um, okay, so. <laughs> I knew so, that was coming. As soon as that rant little started, I was like, I know this. Now there's, there's, Freelancers kill me. There, there's somebody on the, on the MMO Champion thread that basically says that it doesn't matter what ArenaNet does, whether they do or do not allow add-ons, this advanced combat tracker, this ACT, is going to be able to pull all that data from the memory in real time and display it in an overlay over the game. Uh, maybe that will be true. If it, if it is, then it'll happen. Um, if it's not, then it won't. Uh, I'm not, I don't really have an opinion on that one way or the other because knowing your performance... I don't think that's a that's a game breaking advantage or disadvantage in the moment. I think it's a very important tool for players to learn how to get better. It's like freelancer said, testing things out and trying to figure out, okay, is is this combination of skills doing as much damage as I think it will? You know, math crafting and theory crafting can only get you so far. Well, all, all jokes aside, let's look at it like this. If I'm uh, if if anybody's running your guild in World v World, and you want to improve on taking down keep doors, right? Who who wasn't who doesn't want to do that? So you have your entire guild, you have your entire guild, uh, fifty, thirty, whatever it might be, at the door of this keep, and we'll say siege weapons aren't in this particular battle. So how else could you tell if you wanted to improve the efficiency of your own guild, who's doing more damage to that keep door, or who's just sitting there, you know, right clicking, auto attack, and then they go and get their chicken nuggets, you know? Um, <laughs> I mean, you, it, it, do you phys or is ArenaNet telling us that we have to physically, as a guild leader or as a guild officer, walk around to every one of our members to see if he's casting different types of skills? I mean, is that what they're forcing us to do? Um, so far, you know, so far. So, I, go ahead. I, I, I could see, I could definitely see the advantages to having sort of a, like, data tracker. 
like you're kind of saying. For me, add-ons that are just tracking the data that's going on at a time of attacks and all that stuff, is, it, to me, is all right. It's the point when the game you is, say... The add-on is playing the game for you. Exactly. It's the point <laughs> when you say that, well, I know my DPS could be this with all my skills, so let my add-on just do the rotation for me, and I'll just sit here and eat my chicken nuggets. You know, that's what I don't like. I do, I do appreciate having that sort of data that you could go back to and look for. And as, even as if a it's guild leader, the fact, even like if you they... say, that could definitely be useful if you're a guild leader, knowing who's actually doing stuff and who's just sitting there. Do we know the stance on macros? I mean, everybody here, if you have a, you know, a Naga, you know quite what I'm talking about. Um, does our, has ArenaNet, and correct me if I'm wrong, I don't believe they have yet, have they said there is something against, because WoW allows it so long as it doesn't do certain things with your character, um, do they have a stance with macros? Does anybody know? Uh, they haven't said anything yet as far as I know. They haven't said, like, no or yes either way as far as I can tell. But... You mean macros that will, you know, cast skill X, then then jump, then yeah. cast skill Y kind of a thing? Because in WoW well, you can, like, chain your trinkets and stuff, can't you? With just yeah, like, like in WoW, for example, as my rogue, um, I would have my, my cloak uh, my cloak of shadows and my uh, my dash bound to my 12 key on my naga. So the idea is if I got hit by a uh, CC of some sort, not only do I immediately cast Cloak of Shadows, which breaks CCs and uh, you know gets me out of it, uh, it also will cast dash so I can quickly get out. And that's a very simple one. I had others that were far more complex, but those were allowed to an extent. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious if Guild Wars, uh, if ArenaNet, and I'm hoping we hear about that, if they'll allow such things where you can combine different skills well, on two single keys. Well, I mean, they're probably not going to have something built into the game, but there's nothing stopping you from using third-party software to say that when I hit that key, it, See, it like does this answer. and this and, that, and such and such a key. I mean, I, I, think, I think in a competitive scene, obviously that won't be allowed, but I don't think Guild Wars is going to have it to the point where World of Warcraft has it, that where they have a macro screen where you can make macros to just hit my four key and do this rotation but at the same time i'm sure you know all the razor software that's out there you can make your own macros that aren't using the game which is using your third-party software well, just because i can doesn't mean i'm going to if they say no you know it's just like with the nda all the nda breaks you know it's it's quite pathetic really you know just because you can record it just because you can leak it doesn't mean you should and um with the macros, I mean, if they officially say we don't allow macros, something tells me also that they're going to throw something in there that detects if you're perfectly executing the same set of skills over and over. WoW did, and people got banned. So Really? Oh, that's um, interesting. Someone absolutely. just said in chat, the only macro they need is slash target freelancer. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I mean, wow. there are a lot of really, like, uh, interesting macros that were simply key savers because we all know world of warcraft i mean piles so many damn skills at you and some of them are usable in combat some of them are usable out combat and so i remember specifically one that i made that was basically my i want to go faster button and when it was like when i was out of combat and not in a dungeon you know it, it would it, you know, if not in combat and outside or whatever however the macro was set up then it would you know call my uh, my mount but if I was in combat or in a dungeon, then it would turn me into uh, wolf form as a shaman or what have you. And, and, and maybe cast like one of my go fast skills or something to that effect. So, so that, those, those kind of like just saved you from having you know, four or five keys for the same thing if, this, if you use a different one in you know, different game, in-game conditions. But if you allow those kind of things, which are really innocu innocuous, just key savers you're basically allowing other things, which is like, you know, do your rotation for you. But yeah, if they can detect that stuff, then maybe, maybe it wouldn't be so bad to have that kind of thing I mean, in there. One example of just like how macros can be misused, or someone just reminded me in chat, there was one that Swifty had in WoW, and it was like a macro on how to do 100,000 um, damage to someone in a battleground as a warrior. And it was like certain trinkets, he bound these trinkets and then abilities that he had. And it literally, you would see it on the screen, like boom, 100,000 damage. And I think <laughs> thing, things like that is just ridiculous. Like Press now, button, like, win game? Is that what that was? Yeah. In, he was like in a battleground, a rated battleground, I think, and he would just press one button, it'd be one hundred thousand damage. Like, he had a he had a bunch of trinkets and potions and scrolls yeah. on him, Bridger. Yeah, there's that a, a when he used it, 
like I had my own buff uh, macros, but he he went all out with it. He got every little macro he could that increased his damage, his strength output, and bound bound it to one key. And he and he so it I forget what he called potion, it. It was something funny. Then he would funny. do some kind of a another another buff for extra strength, like all these temporary strength yeah. buffs right before hitting something with a big boom. Yeah. yeah. It, and uh, I, I, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh. I, I just, I just think, I just think that macros in general also have that same effect that add-ons do, where they could simplify actions. Like you're saying, you could do the hundred thousand damage and whatever for this one macro. Imagine if there was a macro in, I don't know, let's just say like StarCraft, StarCraft Two, where there was a macro that you just hit your button or whatever, and it automatically just does your first like five minutes of building. You know, it just it just sends your workers, it builds your supply depots, it does all this. And then you just leave it on autopilot unless, you know, and autopilot. then you can just scout. You, you can I, work about scouting, it'll take care of your economy because it already knows what you want to do. Exactly. I mean, <laughs> if, you know, it, it's granted, you know, it's a, that's kind of like an off-the-wall example. But it's just that, that when you think about it in a different game, it sounds so much more game-breaking than it does in certain MMOs. You know, you can't you can't do stuff like that because the whole point of the game is, is that you need to be able to manage your keys and manage your character and manage what's going on around you. You need to know all those things and what to do in certain situations. When you make a macro that says, oh, I hit R and it's going to automatically target the person that has this condition on them and I'm automatically going to cast my, my deconditioner, you know, that breaks the game. It takes away that whole element of you having to keep track of what's going on in the battlefield. I think one of the things that Guild Wars 2 is going to do to break, even if they did allow add-ons, which it, it, obviously they aren't, at least not at launch, um, it, even if they did allow macros or, or, or um, add-ons to, to sort of target things for you, even if they did allow macros, that would... So many of the important skills, like the buffs or the debuffs, are ground target based. So you'll still have to manually target things. You, it, your, your macro can't like do slash target, you know, uh, healer and then make sure that he's you know protected by your you know warrior taunt you know thing or whatever it is so that I think will will solve that kind of a problem so if there's no macros it it takes away some of those convenience items we were talking about before but the fact that Guild Wars 2 has really no more than let's say 15 16 buttons in comparison to WoW that would have so many ridiculous numbers of skills that you'd probably have to have access to in a given fight. You wouldn't use all of them all the time, but in certain conditions you'd want to use, you know, up to 20 or 30. I mean, you see people with those skill bars on the top, on the right and on the, I mean, I was one of those people. I had the two tier skill bar on the bottom and two tier skill bar on the right. So, uh, and then of course, God forbid, if you were a druid and you switched into another form, <laughs> I mean, it yeah. just replaced a bar, but still. So that's all a lot of the macro required problems is you don't have as many buttons to keep track of in, in Guild Wars 2 and, and that's okay with me yeah because it's not like you have the option to add extra button slots you literally if you want a different skill you switch it on your utility side and you know you can't just be like I'm going to have an extra you know skill bar and things like that so I think there will be less generic need for macros but then again the things like in WoW for example I really wanted um the time lost Drake, for example. So I made a macro like forward slash times lost Drake or whatever you had to do to try and find it. And um, it was just really easy for things like that to be able to find things that I wanted to find that were rare and things like that. And I think that would be a good thing, but macros in regards to combat, I think would be pretty pointless in Guild Wars 2. Well, let's not forget the more you allow macros, the more you allow Chinese farmers to take over mm -hmm. the servers. So That's mm -hmm. true. And my only concern with not allowing macros, and I don't think this is a good enough reason to allow macros, but the fact that you know people with G15 keys are using auto hotkey or other things are going to be able to make macros, and they are going to be able to use them essentially with the third-party programs. Now, if they can detect that and say, hey, you know, you can't start the game up if you've got auto hotkey in the background, eh, that's that's a problem because some people, you know, for example, the problem that we have right now, you can't use Shift plus one, two, three, four, to bind to anything in the game. So I was thinking of using auto hotkey simply to allow me to bind shift one to like K so that the game would actually register shift one as a key that I could press. And that way I wouldn't have to, you know, move my hand too far away from WASD. So there's I, all, all kinds of pros and cons to that, this issue now that I think about it. <laughs> that's, exactly, that's exactly why I want to buy a Naga Hex. 
just to have access to more keys. Yes. All right, so uh, let's get through a couple of questions here from the mailbag, and then everybody's like, wrap it up, wrap it up. Game of Thrones is almost on. So yeah, 10 minutes. <laughs> 10 minutes. Let's do it. All right. Austin, a.k.a. Hawken, sends in a uh, question for us. He says, quote, how do you expect earning PvP slash endgame gear will work, and how would you like it to work? Thanks, and keep up the good work, Qu- unquote. So... What do you guys think? We know kind of, we know that it's going to plateau. We don't know exactly how it's going to work, but how I think that I've heard that it's going to work is that at the end game, there is a list of different um, sets of statistics that will be available on gear itself, right? And so gear that drops will have a, whatever look it has, and it may also be tied to, or maybe it gets randomly assigned one of these sets. Set 20 gives you extra power and extra vitality and set 21 gives you only extra power and set 22 gives you extra you know vitality and toughness and you know malice or what have you right so there's i don't know a hundred sets or of different kinds of gear that you can get and we also know that gear with only one statistic will give you less total extra stats boost than gear with two, which will give you less than gear with three, etc. So you might get plus 100 power if it's only thing on the gear. You would get plus uh, 60 power and plus 60 vitality, so a total of 120 boost. So they do that to try and make min-maxing uh, quite uh, a little bit less powerful. Uh, that's kind of what I know about it. What do you guys know? Do you guys know any more than that? Does the chat room know any more? I'm, I'm not entirely positive on my topic here. Well, I mean, what we're looking at um, to answer his question is this is going to be a game where if you come from WoW or, or Lord of the Rings even or Warhammer, instead of having different tiers you know, each and every season, uh, they're, it's going to stick to the Guild Wars 1 uh, promise of everybody's on a uh, theoretical level playing field. And it isn't so much your gear. I mean, you can customize your gear far more than you could in Guild Wars 1. But you can't get higher tiers of gear where you run into that issue that I'm sure you know or I, I know I know it, where you if you don't have the highest tier at any given time, you're worthless. So this is a game of being able to fully customize your armor, fully customize your loadout, your skills, etc. To the way you like it, you want to go full power? Fine. You want to go full crit? Fine. You can do that. But you are still on a somewhat level playing field. And what it's really going to matter in terms of how you get that gear is how you use it. And it's going to come down to your player skill. And I think that we can all say that's awesome about Guild Wars 2. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I, I assume that, um, you know... It's, it's all going to be based on, you know, oh, I want that cool looking gear. And then you can take the, you know, decide what stats you want. And then, and, and like I said, there's the stats on the gear itself. And then you can also upgrade all of the gear with the upgrade slots that are kind of like, you know, jewels in Diablo 2 or, or in, uh, in World of Warcraft. You, you can upgrade it with specific things that you want. And that creates sort of set pieces. This is stuff too. All right. Uh, thank you, Austin, for the question. Next up, uh, T has a question for us. I like you, a quote, I like you guys, Cass, but uh, I I really do, but you seem to bash WoW a lot, considering how much you guys seem to have played of it. (laughs) I mean, the way you guys talk about it as if it's the shittiest game ever released. If that's so, (laughs) then why did so many people play it for so long? I mean, really, tone it down. You guys seem hypocritical, if anything. I will take this one. All right, freelancer. Oh, I wanted to take... (laughs) (laughs) All right, what was his name again, Bridger? T, he just assigned it T. T. So he didn't want... Okay, I see what he did there. <laughs> okay, I played WoW since it, I was in the original beta uh, for the original WoW. I, back when it was level 50 cap, had my Hunter Night Elf. I loved the game, and it was the best game ever launched then. I still believe that. Now, when you hear me, because I know you're pointing at me. I know you're writing an email about me. <laughs> oh, no, I'm in there. Blizzard, too. World of Warcraft is not... Blizzard is not the Blizzard it was back then. I, I don't think there's a soul in the in the chat room, reading the forums, in any community that says that the WoW back then was not an incredibly A plus game. I don't. You won't find them now. The argument comes into what is WoW turned into, and just to sum it up real quick, not to go too long. WoW used to be original. It used to bring all of these new concepts, make it easy for the average player, for me, an EverQuest player, to just invite my friends, invite my family to play the game. And it simplified everything to the point where I could bring my girlfriend in, my now wife, you know, and she could play it and enjoy the game because they made it that accessible. Now, nowadays, 
there is no innovation anymore. Um, and if you look into that, I'm sure you'll see, you know, everything down to their achievement system, stolen from Lord of the Rings, okay, their achievement point system. Uh, we constantly, we bash WoW because all of these new things that are being brought in these new expansions of WoW are being are basically mishmashes of things that Guild Wars 2 is doing or things that Aeon did or and it's just there's no innovation there anymore and um, so it's it's bashing yes in, in, by definition but uh, it's not to say that WoW wasn't a great game back in its golden days fair enough <laughs> fair enough Vega your thoughts I my, my only thoughts are I completely agree with what Bridger... I, God, free Bridger. <laughs> I don't know why Bridger, I keep on doing this. The free Bridger this. strikes <laughs> The free again. Bridger. Um, <laughs> the only reason why I bash it is because I can see everyone saying when Guild Wars 2 comes out, trying to compare it to WoW. I can see so many people, because of how successful WoW has been trying to compare everything that Guild Wars 2 is doing to WoW and saying that, oh, it doesn't do this well or it doesn't do that well or blah, blah, blah. And the whole reason why I compare it is because you ask most of the gamers out there, everyone knows what World of Warcraft is. You know, not everyone has played EVE, not anyone has played Lord of the Rings or Warhammer or all these other games, but, you know, most people are going to know what World of Warcraft is. So when you compare things and try and compare and contrast to a game like World of Warcraft, it lets people know what you're trying to get at. Mm -hmm. And it's just the fact that I feel that a lot of people are going to compare it to Guild Wars 2 when it comes out, even though Guild Wars 2 is doing everything completely different in so many good ways. So that's just my two cents on it. You know what the best thing that came from WoW was? It's the face Paul moment here. Chuck Norris jokes. <laughs> Wait a minute, that <laughs> came thing from for... World of Warcraft? Baron's chat, man. I have a shirt in my closet <laughs> that says "I survived Baron's chat." Me? In the That's Chuck the Norris first jokes. episode of, uh, that we had, the first video episode, you were wearing that shirt, and everybody's like, "I, I agree with Baron's chat guy." I know, and and, and, it, and it takes a vanilla WoW gamer to understand what Baron's chat is. If you don't know what Baron's chat is, I'm not going into it. Just be glad, <laughs> be glad you were spared. <laughs> Fair enough. I liked the Barons, man. I didn't like the people, but I liked the zone. That's okay. Don't hate don't hate the player. Wait, I no, like the hate chat. the player, don't hate the zone? I don't know. I like the chat because the questing was so boring there that I had to read something <laughs> while I was doing stuff. I oh, loved it snap. because it was the first neutral PvP area that I could gank Horde in. Oh, screw you, <laughs> Alliance scum. Typical freelance answer. <laughs> it was. It was the lowest zone that was, uh, what is it, hostile or whatever, where his red name. And, yeah. uh, and you could go in there as my Night Elf Hunter and just... <laughs> own everybody in sight and it was so open too so it was easy to pick out your targets oh yeah the memories contested so contested there you go yeah i i liked a lot of what world of warcraft was doing i never liked how stretched out the content was i i really got into the game heavily but every single time i tell you the first time i played it I, I i played in the beta and then i made a shaman and i played it until level 36 and I said, this is ridiculous. I'm doing the same thing over and over again. I'm done. And I left. And then I started playing again. And I leveled a brand new character with my then girlfriend, now wife, up to level 40. Meanwhile, I got my level 36 up to level 53-ish. And then I realized again, okay, nothing's changed. I'm still doing the same thing over and over again. And it's just not interesting to me coming from an RTS and an FPS background. I got to be doing more stuff. It's too damn boring. I'm always hitting the same skill rotation. I'm never making any interesting decisions. There's no real skill to be had here because I'm still in the leveling thing. I'm not going to talk about raids and stuff. I really did enjoy the exploration. I really did enjoy the challenge and the interesting uh, aspects of the dungeons, like trying to figure out how a boss worked. Those kinds of things could be really interesting and engaging to me but again be between those was just hours and hours of grueling kill quests and delivering quests and waiting to go all on the stupid flight path all the way back to the capital city to get my new you know skill or what have you and it's just it's just boring my head off so then i when the when the cataclysm came out i went back again and i got from level 53 up to level 67 and then i gave up again i just i just hate the fact that they continue to make you spend so much time doing what you don't want to do just to get to the things that you do want to do. The world is so vast and so filled with filler, it just makes me gag inside. I guess that's my way to put it. Ooh. 
Go ahead. Awkward silence. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> well, All we, right. it's it's nine o'clock. I think. Uh, All everyone's right. Gonna, Game of Thrones is playing. Send us hate mail. <laughs> we're yeah, we're gonna get a ton of hate mail from these WoW PVPers. I just <laughs> see it now. <laughs> uh it's it's probably true. It's Two probably ants, true. one show. That's what the title of this one should be. Someone just said it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll sum it up here in one uh, one little phrase. WoW turned into a Counter Strike community. There you go. Ooh, wow, turned into a Counter Strike community. All right, that's so deep. I think yeah. that's a deep. We can't we can't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> so deep. Another day, another time. Think <laughs> next week we'll come back with wow as a counter-strike community after we've had a week to to mull it over you know very high philosophy and uh, there you go so i think we're going to end the show there there's a bunch of other questions that we're probably going to try to get to next week because i don't anticipate a whole lot of big reveals between now and next week next week is pax by the way uh next weekend um, so we're going to try to start the show at 8 o'clock. I, I, I anticipate being able to get home and start the show at 8 o'clock, but it might be a little bit late depending on how, how late I get back from PAX. So I uh, hope everybody is able to make it there again Sunday. And don't forget, uh, feedback at talesofteria.com is how you can send us messages, questions, content. What do you want us to talk about? Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at Tales of Tyria. And I think that's it. I think yep. it's... If you guys, if you guys see uh, Team Legacy or Bridger at PAX, we'll all be wearing. Uh, you've seen these shirts, these little shirts here. Um, give us a shout. Say, hey, I saw you in a, I saw you on, a, you know, Tales of Tyria, and that way Bridger knows uh, <laughs> who the heck you are as you're, as you're creepy, rushing up to him. Not a creepy stalker. Yeah, don't be yeah. a creepy stalker and be like, I wonder if I know that guy. And you're like staring from 20 feet away. Don't do that, please. Just come up it's and say, hey. Good. Yeah. Just so say, this... are you Bridger? And then they'll go, no, 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 I'm just in Team Legacy. And then, and then oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not true. That, that, actually, we'll probably be traveling in a group for, for all I know. I'm also trying to, and, and I'd like people to send us feedback. Feedback at TalesOfTeria.com. Uh, if you are going to Kineticon, I'm thinking about submitting a panel idea for discussing Guild Wars 2 at Kineticon. I've done a panel at Kineticon before. It's a everything con in Hartford, Connecticut, happening in, I think it's July this year. Uh, I think uh, you can just do a search for Kineticon. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's very interesting. It started as an anime con, but now it does a lot of video games. They have a lot of board games. They have a lot of RPG stuff there as well. Still a lot of anime stuff. Uh, a lot of anime stuff. But yeah, if you guys are going there and I think there's going to be a big enough audience, maybe I'll do it. Maybe we'll get Great and, uh, and Aku to join me because they're both in Connecticut. They could probably come up for that. Uh, I think I with drive that, down. Vega, drive down. There you go. Bam. I think with that, it's time to leave. We're going to head on over. <laughs> <laughs> so for those of you that are probably that are not going to be watching Game of Thrones live, uh, we're going to head over to the iDrop stream. If he's in, if not, it'll be right here on the Tales of Tyria stream. And uh, it's going to be a good time. Going to cast some League of Legends. But with that, I will leave you with this Game of Thrones violin cover, the most amazing thing I have ever heard. Have a good night, everybody. Bye. Bye.